Welcome to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. Each week we talk about heart rate variability and how it can be used to improve your overall health and wellness. Please consider the information in this podcast for your informational use and not medical advice. Please see your medical provider to apply any of the strategies outlined in this episode. Heart Rate Variability Podcast is a production of Optimal LLC and Optimal HRV. Check us out at OptimalHRV.com. Please enjoy the show. Welcome, friends, to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. I am really excited for our guest today. Um, I met her over LinkedIn, just one of those random things where LinkedIn connected us uh, and uh, started just to, to look at uh, the research being done by our guest today and got, uh, I think, immediately, maybe the third in our back and forth on LinkedIn, asked her to be on the podcast because I just couldn't wait to explore her work. So I, I'm really excited to welcome Rabia to the show. Um, and Rabia, just get for our listeners, can you just give a quick introduction of yourself before? I'm, I'm so excited to jump into your research, but just a quick introduction of you before we uh, dive in. Uh, first of all, thanks very much, Matt, for inviting me here today. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so, yeah, my name is Rabia, and I am a finally PhD student at Bournemouth University here in the UK. And um, in terms of my academic background, it's been quite interdisciplinary in nature. I did my undergrad in biotech, biotechnology, and then I went on doing master's in environment and human health at the University of Exeter here in the UK. And, um, yeah, so it's been quite you know, sort of multidisciplinary in nature. And um, yeah, so for my PhD, I'm, I'm looking at the effect of combat injury mm -hmm. on heart rate variability in a cohort of British military veterans and personnel. And this PhD project is in collaboration with the Dawn City that I'll be talking about, you know, in the in the chat today. Awesome. So and just a disclaimer, sorry, oh. just a disclaimer that I'm not a clinician by any means. So, yeah, I'm just, you know, a regular academic student here. That, that, that's, yeah, uh, that, that, that we can almost use the term doctor for. So you got my yeah, respect yeah. there. Maybe uh, there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just before we dive into the specifics, I, I just kind of would love to hear when, how did HRV come onto your radar? When, when did you become interested? Because I'm assuming you could have gone a lot of different directions with your, your focus. Why HRV? How did you learn about it? I just love to get a little bit of background on what, what got you uh, interested. Yeah, so uh, I think I'm going to give you a very cheeky answer there. Uh, I think HRV found me, uh, as in, you know, I landed on this project. So um, so th when I joined this project, it was already kind of, you know, predefined as in, you know, the aims and the research question and everything. But of course, you know, along the way, I sort of informed the you know, how the, the analysis plan and how we're going to be taking, you know, from there. So it has definitely evolved. But yeah, prior to this PhD project, I didn't know much about HRV. So I was kind of, you know, HRV naive before I started working with this um, project. So whatever I've learned about HRV, it's been, you know, been through, been through project. this project. Yeah. Well, impressive that you have. I'm just kind of looking at your, your page here. Uh, quite a bit of articles published already for someone yeah. someone new to it so so let's dive in so you come you come into this project uh you know you you didn't have a whole lot of background on heart rate variability i i would love to get because when i'm looking at your background that there seems to be your expertise lying in you know heart rate variability as it applies to traumatic brain injuries uh, with uh, military veterans, if I'm if I'm kind of drawing that out, and I wonder, sort of, what what kind of are you learning from the research? I know that's a big question, but I'll give you I'll give you plenty of room uh, to to kind of explore some of the research you've done and the insights uh, that have evolved out of the research. Yeah, so yeah, it's a big question. So I'm just going to you know break the answer into pieces. Absolutely. <laughs> So for you to understand my research, I think it's very important that everybody understands, you know, the, the advanced study here. So because that's where, you know, that that's where I'm using the data from. So um, advanced is an acronym and it stands for Armed Services Trauma Rehabilitation Outcome Study. It's a mouthful, but, you know, it's a collaboration between King's College London, Imperial College London 
and the Academic Department of Military Rehabilitation here in the UK. So um, it's it's a longitudinal perspective cohort study that's designed to span over 20 years, and it aims to investigate the long-term impact of combat injury on various psychological, physiological, and social outcomes in uh, British military veterans and personnel, those who served in Afghanistan. So um, that's the context. Uh, so in terms of my research, um, just a correction there, that I'm not looking at the you know uh, traumatic brain injury and HIV. I'm looking at as a as a wider aspect of injury, as in it's not just the TBI. So it's it's a myriad, it's a wide collection of injuries there. We've got blast injuries, we've got gunshot wounds, we've got falls, fractures, burns, and you know other sorts of injury. And um, and one interesting aspect about my research is that. It's not acute trauma because, you know, in the past, we've had loads of studies on acute trauma in HIV. So that's not the case here. Um, and again, connecting back to the advance, that uh, advanced study is currently in the third wave of data collection. So we've already have two waves done. So I've looked at the baseline and um, and I think I'm happy to share the results of the baseline analysis because that's something that's already published, you know, with all of my papers that you've been reading. Yeah, I, I would love to learn. Yeah, please do share. Okay, so uh, in terms of my results, so there, first of all, let me just give you a quick rundown of all the, you know, the themes that I've explored in my PhD so far. Awesome. So I've looked at the reliability and validity of using um, ultra short-term HRV, the one derived from femoral arterial waveforms as a proxy source for short-term ECG induced HRV. So that's one aspect. And in other set of papers, I've looked at the association between combat injury and HRV, and also looking at the effect of certain mediating factors that could potentially affect this relationship. And, um, and then I've also looked at the effect of um, uh, different types of breathing protocols, like spontaneous breathing and slow-paced breathing yeah. in HRV in the injured. So um, yeah, it's been it's been very really sort of you know comprehensive. Uh, really. So I'm just going to take it one by one. Sounds good. So, um, and so in terms of the, the results for support, um, it, it, you need to understand the composition of the groups there. So we've got two groups. Uh, we've got injured and the uninjured. Mm -hmm. So of course in the injured group, uh, we have participants who were injured during their deployment in Afghanistan, and they sustained severe combat injuries. And um, that required, you know, uh, aromatic evacuation to a UK hospital for treatment rehabilitation. Whereas the uninjured group, as the name implies, you know, they were uninjured and they have been frequently matched to the injured group based on their age, uh, rank, and uh, role in theatre and deployment period. So that, you know, they are similar in characteristics, you know, in all those characteristics, except the exposure is different, that being, you know, combat injury. So that's the difference between the two groups. So probably the psychological impact of being in war would probably be equal, similar. I mean, an injury obviously is the variable you're measuring, but both have been exposed to exactly. the, the, the psychological challenges of war too. Yeah. So excellent. Exactly. So both of the group, both of the participants in the groups have been exposed to the same operational environment. So it's just the combat injury that's you know that's different. Gotcha. So uh, in terms of the baseline, um, the reason I had to sort of uh, explore the reliability and validity of, you know, ultra short term HRV was because we know that, you know, PPV has been used as a surrogate source for, you know, short term ECG based HRV, but this particular signal that I've used for my, you know, for my research had not been used before. So I had to sort of, you know, work from scratch, right from the scratch, you know, establish its reliability and validity and the results suggest that you know it's as reliable and as valid as the you know the ECG based five minute uh, short term HRV. So that's quite interesting. Yeah. So yeah, so that we have the measure there. So can so, you talk a little bit more because you know one of the things I was interested about when I was looking at your articles was the ultra short term heart rate yeah. variability. So I'm assuming that's the measure that you're talking about yeah. for for us HRV nerds out here. Um, I think when you said, ooh, a valid measure, can you can you describe that in a little bit more uh, detail for us? 
Yeah, so the so I've used the primary alt here waveforms um to measure ultra short term HRV. And when I say ultra short term HRV, I've you uh, I've used RMSSE. Okay. So why RMSSE? Because you know it's it's a superstar in the HRV world because you know it's reliable and invalid uh, in terms of you know ultra short term HRV analysis because that's what we've seen in the previous evidence. So informed by that. Uh, and of course, because the length of that signal was just up to 16 seconds, I could not have gone for, you know, short term HRV. Right. And I could not have gone for other frequency based measures of HRV. So RMSSD seemed the most suitable measure of HRV. So that's what I've reported. So in a nutshell, I've looked at the association between ultra short term RMSSD and combat injury uh, in these two groups. Excellent. Thank you for that. So, so and you're you're seeing that if I'm hearing you right, 16 second RMSSD, you validated that as a, a major. Uh, let me just ask the question: equivalent to a five minute RMSSD measurement? Exactly. Yeah. Wow. And would so would you would you let so. I just want to make sure because I think everybody who's listening to this is jumping to the conclusion of. Oh, that five minute reading that we're doing and have done for years, we could get the same data in 16 seconds, question mark. So let me throw that out to you because that's kind of what I'm sure you've got a lot of people listening to uh, potentially excited about. Yeah, I mean, um, that's so I think that's the that's the type of question that's always been there. As in, yeah. you know, if if it's as reliable as the short minute, as the short term HRV. Is there any need to measure short-term HRV? So, of course, the the answer is yes. I mean, you're looking at two types of things. You're looking at ultra short-term HRV and short-term HRV. Yeah. Short-term HRV has its own advantages as compared to ultra short-term HRV. You've got more limitations with ultra short-term HRV because, like I said, you, you're limited with just you know RMSSD. Whereas yeah. for short-term, you have you know wider collection of other measures like frequency-based. You, you you can tell more about the physiology you know, with, with the help of frequency-based measures. Not to say that, you know, RMSSD can't say that, but, you know, it's just, you know, that really depends on the type of question that you're okay. trying to answer and the type of data, of course. Okay, so we shouldn't necessarily throw out our three, four, five-minute approach. You're just, you're just kind of that. adding something really juicy and exciting to the existing research with, looking at it from this perspective. Yeah, and, and of course, having said this, while I've looked at ultra short-term HRV at baseline, at the first follow-up, I've looked at short-term HRV. So okay. it's not like that, you know, I'm just relying on one method. It's it's better to explore that, you know, the ultra short-term HRV could also do the same thing. But I'm just saying that, you know, we just explore that, you know, there exists another way yeah. of looking at HRV. Awesome. That that's so exciting. So if you just stopped there, we would have a great episode that would blow a lot of people's minds. But let's let's continue into uh the, the research with the uh, veterans now. Yeah, so um so this paper that I'm the, the results that I'm um sharing now, so this was published in BMW Military Health. So in this one, I was looking at the effect of combat injury on HRV, ultra term HRV, using the method that, that I just described. Um, in the injured and also, you know, in the uninjured. So using the, you know, the multivariate regression analysis, you know, the drill, you, you look at the associations after uh, adjusting for the confounding variables there. So um, another interesting point that I'd like to highlight here is that I've not just looked at injury, I've looked at other aspects of injury as well. So I've looked at injury severity and injury mechanism and also the effect of amputation. Okay. So we found through the multivariate regression analysis, we found that as compared to the uninjured group, in the injured group, um, injury, high injury severity, blast as a mechanism of injury, and amputation, all four of them were independently associated with lower RMSSD. Okay. In other words, in other words, uh, it would mean that uh, you know the the injured group seems to have lower parasympathetic tone as compared to the uninjured group. And it's not just, again, it's not just acute trauma. The the time elapses since, since injury, it's been on average eight years. Okay. Interesting. So, yeah. 
Yeah, so it is interesting. So it appears that, you know, even eight years after injury, where the injured participant should have gone, you know, to parasympathetic rebound, you right. know, in terms of recovery, it seems like it, it's not it's not the case. Or maybe the recovery time for that rebound is taking longer, Interesting. you know, because it's been eight years since injury. So that is an interesting finding. And because of the longitudinal nature of the data, it would be interesting to see that, you know, if that's going to be changed, you know, with the upcoming follow-ups. Because, I, you know, in, and I think it's more popular literature, but, but by real researchers who I respect, it seems like there's this message we get, which again, we're looking at a, a very specific population, a very specific injury, but like, oh, if you, if you have an accident and you go through something like an amputation, that basically you rebound, I, I think it's like six to eight months, your happiness level and all this kind of rebounds, just like if you win the lottery, you know, you have a you have a short term peak when you get that new car, new house, but then it kind of drops back to baseline. But what you're really finding is, and again, I think the powerful thing about your research is both groups have been in war, so they they've experienced these things. But it seems like this this trauma associated with a physical injury is is a lingering in a way that yeah. just the, just the psychological traumas of war may not be and that's a that's that's fascinating and i'm kind of reading you right with what you're what you're finding yeah yeah absolutely so it's um i think in a nutshell the the idea is that the effect of combat injury on hrv seems to be lasting rather than you know tran transient yeah so um i mean that's that's at least what the the, the results suggest and do you did you look at uh, because I'm I'm sure quite a few people in both groups may have gotten like mental health support uh, for trauma. I'm sure there's PTSD in both groups and and other things going on. Did you did did that variable play? I did you study that? Did you did you see any um, difference uh, if you did study it? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And um, so that leads me to talk about the, the next analysis that I conducted. So um, this analysis and results that I'm talking about now was published in Military Medicine, if somebody wants to give it a read. Uh, so um, in this one, basically, so once I had identified that, you know, there is a significant association between combat injury and HRV, I wanted to dig deeper and see if this association was being mediated by, you know, the usual suspects, like you yeah. said depression, anxiety, mm -hmm. and physical function like, you know, um, six minute hopelessness and BMI. Uh, you know, I, I use the structural occasion modeling approach for the mediation analysis. And I found that, you know, to my surprise that uh, BMI, six, um, sorry, BMI, depression, and anxiety did not significantly mediate the relationship between, you know, HIV and combat injury, but the six minute walk test did. Mm, so- Fascinating. Yeah, so in other words, it appears that uh, if there is any factor that could potentially offset the adverse effect of combat injury in HIV, it looks like it could be enhanced physical function or physical function for that matter. So um, that's quite interesting because yeah. we, we this is quite important evidence because we need that evidence to inform, you know, the, the recovery pathway and to, you know, all the practices, of, you know, related with the rehabilitation of the injured. Wow. Uh, boy, so, so do you, I, my mind's going in like 20 different places, which is not great for a mm -hmm. podcast host to be uh, stirring all this around. So like, what do you think is happening? Let me, let me just ask that question. Cause I, I mean, the, the, what, what do you think is going on there? Because I mean, amputations and injuries are probably, I'm just thinking about like what a leg injury versus an arm injury and, movement and mobility i just give me your your thoughts on this as, as i kind of uh organize a, a more logical question that i might follow up with with that what you just said yeah i think that's a fair question so um of course like you said you know lots of things going on there um uh, but again i think you have to be very cautious in terms of the interpretation there because i think the 
since there are so many factors, you know, playing their part in this equation, so you need to be very careful. So um, I've just looked at one wave, and you know, that's what I've uh, yeah. been talking about here. So it would be interesting to see that you know what we see in the upcoming waves, you know, upcoming follow-ups, because you know it could be, you know, like our statistician would say, you know, it would be a blip. You know, yeah. maybe it's going to be changed in the next wall or maybe change in the next one. We don't know that. But what it tells us it tells us is that it's it's preliminary evidence and it is an important evidence. And we need that information to sort of, you know, um, guide the, the, the other questions that we need to sort of answer this question, you know, in a holistic manner, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. And, and just out of curiosity too, did, did you have, so collecting the, the ultra, well, you, you just have heart rate variability data, but looking at the, the ultra short term, did you get that? When did you start collecting that on the group? Was that a pre-deployment? Was that a post-injury? Like, I'm just curious about when did you kind of start collecting the baseline data? So uh, it's been, so like I said, on at baseline, the, the time to assessment, the baseline assessment has been on average eight years. So whatever data that we've collected in the advanced city has been after. Okay. Injury. Okay. Yeah. Just, you know, because of all those questions of like, you know, and again, just kind of trying to think about that, that the impact on this on everybody. Uh, you know, and all those pieces, I, I think would be an interesting thing because of working with folks in the military, which, you know, I've worked with uh, on the psychological end with uh, PTSD, with vets, especially severe things like addiction, homelessness, uh, a range of uh, kind of issues uh, after uh, the deployment's done, you know, is is trying to, you know, what 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 is happening with the psychological pieces of war? How does that, you know, how do both of those groups compare to a a, a non-military group or a military group that wasn't deployed into a war zone? All these kind of questions mm -hmm. that that I think our veterans uh, yeah, helping them, you know, is is the motivation here. But yet the curiosity from mm -hmm. our perspective is what's going on pre post deployment, those sort of things. Um, okay. Just fascinating to see what war does to somebody's autonomic nervous system. Exactly, I hear you, and I, I think it would have been uh, equally interesting to see the the pre deployment HRV. Of course, you know we don't have that, but in the yeah. ideal world, would have been great, you know, to see that you know how that's changed from pre deployment yeah. to you know um, after deployment, after injury, and then you know after several years since injury. Yeah. So that would be, you know, a great. Yeah. Uh, well, hey, you know, you get that doctorate. We we you, you know, we get fun with this. So I, I love I love what you're doing here and how you're thinking about that. So um, before I move on, because I want to look at a, another aspect of of some of uh, the studies that you've done, but just any other sort of insights. Uh, I don't want to move on too quickly if there's uh, more to cover here. Um, yeah, so one insight I've already shared in terms of the, the mediation, uh, you know, the, the effect of six minute walk class as a mediating factor on the relationship between combat and junior HIV. So that was, you know, quite interesting to yes. see. And the other thing would be, you know, seeing the, of course, uh, the, the investigation of different types of breathing protocol was not as such part of my PhD, but I've looked at it anyway, because I was supposed to use one of the breathing protocols. So yeah, that's going to be my it. next question to you anyway. So but let's I, dive in. I had to make an informed decision that, you know, so in advance at the first follow-up, um, and at the first follow-up, we started collecting the ECG data, mm -hmm. uh, something that wasn't there at baseline. And, you know, because of, it was all happening during the COVID, so, you know, the timelines were disrupted, so that brought, you know, these changes. Yeah. Anyway, so um, yeah, so for my other paper, the one published in PMNR, I think. So um, I was supposed to, I was supposed to make an informed decision as to which breathing protocol should be used when the aim is to assess the effect of combat injury on HIV. So I looked at spontaneous breathing and slow-paced breathing at six cycles per minute, you know, and their effect yeah. on HIV. And um, of course, we know there is 
you know, vomiting evidence on it that, you know, slow paced breathing at six cycles per minute is associated with, you know, increase in RMSSD. Yeah. That's, and also, you know, other measures of HRV. Um, but yeah, so uh, back to my question, which uh, breathing protocol should be used? So we thought that, you know, since we are trying to understand the the physiological effect of combat injury on HRV, it would be better to go with spontaneous because, you know, slow paced breathing itself is an intervention. Yes. So we don't want to, you know, you know, cloud the results there. So that was basically idea, the idea behind this particular study. So uh, it's I think the findings are in agreement with the previous uh, evidence that, you know, six cycles per minute, the, this breathing protocol does lead to increase in HRV and as compared to the spontaneous breathing in the injury. So, so do you I see, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, sorry, I, I, just, I was just going to say that, you know, this, does give us um, the the preliminary evidence in terms of you know the the use of HIV biofeedback therapy. I know that this is not exactly that, but you know the the idea is you know still in the periphery that you know you could use HIV biofeedback therapy or slow phase breathing as an intervention in this particular population to elevate HIV. So when it, that that that's awesome, and I, I guess probably to our audience, not incredibly. <laughs> Uh, surprising at, at this point, uh, as we've explored in the podcast so much on, uh, you know, HRV biofeedback. I'm curious, um, you know, one, let me ask you a quick, how often did you measure uh, the, the ultra short term heart rate variability? Were you collecting this on a daily basis? Was this more folks coming into a laboratory setting? Just I would love, I'm sure my audience is thinking, because the HRV nerds out there like myself is like, how often did you measure this? And then I got to follow up with the breathing thing. But just like, how did you get this data? How often did you collect it with these veterans? Yeah, so for the ultra short term HRV, I've used the, uh, so basically in terms of the protocol, we've got the pulse wave analysis and pulse wave velocity that's measured using the y coded device. And we got we use the ECG recordings that's measured using the BT cameras. So um, for ultra short term HRV, because I've used femoral arterial waveforms from the pulse wave velocity measurements, that's done using the Y coder. So that's coming from the Y coder, and we do that in a single session. Okay. And I forgot to tell you about the numbers. It's you know both in the both uh, in the injured group and the uninjured groups, we have five hundred plus participants. So at baseline, the total number was uh, one thousand one hundred forty five. Awesome. So it's you know lots of uh, participants coming, and you know it's it's quite fascinating to have that sort of data. Yeah, you know? it's awesome. Yeah. So, so when amazing. you when you saw the benefits of the pace breathing on ultra short term HRV, which again, so, oh, go ahead, sorry. A correction. It's, so the pace breathing was on short term HRV. Okay, short term HRV. Yeah. So, so you're looking at that kind of like which. Let me see how Bess asks this question. I, I, I'm I'm curious of obviously when you pace your breathing, you're you're artificially in some ways improving your heart rate variability scores. I, I'm curious because you may not have studied this, but did you see like any longer term benefits? I don't know if this was. I guess the question is, was just just kind of a one time comparison, or did you have a group, or did the group? kind of do HRV biofeedback on a regular basis, and then you could see improvements over time with this. Just kind of wondering how you looked at uh, the, the difference in breathing. Yeah, that's a fair question. So um, it was just one time. Okay. Uh, compared. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, we're not trying to introduce any intervention, but yes. we are yeah. mobile data. So yeah. we are quite aware that, you know, slow paced breathing is an intervention. So if, if you know, the injured group uh, is going to practice slow paced breathing, it's going to ultimately affect all other outcomes. Absolutely. So, you know, it's just one time thing and it's just in the protocol. So we have five minutes of spontaneous breathing that's gotcha. followed by five minutes of uh, pace breathing. Awesome. So so pretty good. I mean, I'm sure probably the hypothesis going in is that we would see increased. Uh, but, but again, with this specific populations, really good to know that the pace breathing could help I guess over time, and this is speculation, so I always like to give researchers 
the, that 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 heading to work on is that we we are seeing improvements in HRV with pace breathing, but you didn't as, you weren't measuring the the longer term impacts of an HRV biofeedback practice integrating there, but but at least a little preliminary information that you yeah. know it, it does improve heart rate variability in in, in a very short term way to study it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, that's exactly uh, the point. And of course, it's, it's it's important to look at that because ultimately the point is to use this information to design and inform interventions. Yeah. You know, to uh, you know, to provide best possible care for for the injured. Awesome. I, I'm curious about. I, I assume you're in somewhat of a conversation with folks in the military, uh, having access to all this data. I, I just kind of interested to see what 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 is your conversations been like? I'm sure people are. If I was in the military, I'd be wondering. Okay, it seems like these sort of injuries have a longer term negative impact on our our vets. Um, I'm sure they're asking you, what's this mean for us, or how can we better support that piece? So I'm curious about conversations you've had. Um, after publishing this research uh, about how we might better serve uh, those individuals who protect us? Yeah, um, I think, and that is a very important question to answer. Um, I think, so in terms of my research, it's, it's sort of feed with the advanced study, it's feeding into a bigger, uh, you know, research. So my yeah. project is a part of a bigger research. So it's not the advanced study, it's not just the HRV that we're looking at. We're also looking at other aspects like, you know, we're looking at mental health, we're looking at daily functions such as pain, stress, uh, perceived social support, and, you know, other factors as well. So, um, and cardiovascular risk outcomes as well. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that it's not just one thing. So we are, all of us, we are trying our best to see and draw, you know, a, a fair picture of, you know, what, the, the profile looks like for an injured participant as compared to the uninjured, so that we could use that information to you know sort of understand the long term impact of combat injury, and we are sort of taking that one by one, one thing at a time in the sense that we don't we don't have that evidence now, mm -hmm. so we're trying to build that evidence. Yeah. So once we have that you know evidence base, then we can take it to the next level and see that you know if if, if there are any sort of interconnectedness. For example, my I've, recently collaborated with my um you know fellow um advanced researcher we've looked at the association between PTSD and RMSSE. So uh, I can't talk about the results, but the results are really interesting because um it's, it's still in review. So I'm not gonna be sharing the results. But yeah, so again, long story cut short, I think it's the idea is to see if if there is an opportunity to see the you know the interconnectedness of different factors and how that sort of you know ultimately affecting the the end product. We got promise me to come back on the show uh, when you are able to share that that data because I mean, my curiosity, I, I mean, really got sparked with like we have so many different kind of best practice trauma treatments now for for psychological trauma PTSD. And, and what I'm fascinated with your research is you seem to be, and again, correct me if my words are off here, but but you what what I what I see is that we may want to pe treat people with a physical illness or injury associated with the trauma of just being in war, being in battle that there may be uh, different ways to approach that group. Maybe it's just the different level of support. Maybe it's how we transition them back to society. You know, I think it opens, it probably opens up more questions, which is what great research does. It opens up more questions than it answers. But to me as a clinic, the kind of the clinical part of it is, okay, what we're seeing maybe a different level of long-term autonomic impact um, in this specific group, what what I, I don't have any answers, but what questions do we need to be asking about how we could better uh, serve them moving forward? And again, short term, ultra short term, or short term HRV potentially gives us a metric to 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 measure that as as we think about it more from that clinical side. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. 
Well, what is there anything we've missed? Because I've got a few uh, final questions for you, but I want to make sure we haven't missed anything uh, big in your research that, that you've been doing. Um, not really. I think we've covered the, the major bits and pieces, yeah. Awesome. So as somebody who kind of got into this HRV, uh, having become part of this study, I'm just curious, what do you think about heart rate variability now? Like we we're outside the research, so you, we, we can just put that aside. Let's talk about you. You were new to this metric. I'm sure uh, ha having reviewed your work, you are now an expert on this metric. What's just, what do you think about heart rate variability? Oh gosh, that's an interesting question. So <laughs> I think, <laughs> and I think HRV is such a sensitive marker. I mean, no matter how many confounding variables you're adjusting for, you're controlling for, there is going to be something that, you know, seems to affect it anyway. So it is such a sensitive marker. It is quite fascinating in the same uh, at the same time. So, um, but yeah, over the, over the course of these three years, I've learned a lot. Uh, and it's been, uh, you know, quite a ride in terms of, you know, learning, you know, about HRV, the different methods, the different measures. And one recurring trend is that, you know, if HRV was a theme park that, you know, uh, then RMSSC would be, you know, the roller coaster. You, you can't just ignore it. It's always there. It's yeah. like an integral yeah. part of it. So no many, how many, you know, um, HRV measures we look at, it always boils down to RMSFC. So that's quite interesting to know that because I think it saves you time because uh, I, I think it's sort of preferred because of, uh, you know, certain reasons like, you know, it's got better statistical properties. It's less influenced by the respiratory changes. So I think it's it's a star because of, so because of some reasons there. But um, yeah, so that's, my understanding of HRV now. And um, I think one more thing that I've learned is that HRV is not just, uh, you know, one size fits all mm -hmm. marker, if that makes any sense. So there is no one practical number that's applicable for everybody. So, you know, context matters a lot and it should be taken as a personalized and a bespoke marker. And in, especially in terms of military, uh, I'm, I'm in a, I, mean, I would be a proponent of, you know, going with the HRV daily tracking so that, you know, the participants are able to establish their own baseline norms. Because, you know, yes, of course, you know, five minute or short, short term HRV, these, they, they do tell us about the autonomic state. But, you know, when you do daily tracking, that tells you more. And, you know, you could, as an individual, you could see that, you know, how adjustment to different lifestyle factors like, you know, sleep, diet, physical activity, all those are things, how they could affect your own baseline HRV value and everything. So I think that's another thing that I've learned that, you know, use HRV as a bespoke slash personalized marker, and that's going to be more helpful. Yeah. But we can use that. I mean, that's, that's what I'm going to be pitching for maybe in the future, but let's see. Yeah, well, that, that was my kind of follow-up final question is, uh, you know, now that you, you've, you've, you've sort of seem to have the end in sight as far as going through your doctoral program. Wow. What you have done in that process is spectacular. So congratulations. Uh, just looking at your bio page on the university's website. I have seen, I've, I've interviewed some people who've been in the field for 20 years without the publications uh, that you have. So congratulations on really adding so much to our understanding in a relatively, I'm sure it doesn't seem like a short period of time to you, but in a relatively uh, short period of time, where do you see yourself going? Are you going to be like, oh, as soon as I'm out of here, I don't ever want to think about HRV ever again? Is it something that, that you see as part of your future? Are you just like, I got to get through the next uh, few months uh, and then ask me that question, Matt? I'm just I just kind of curious, uh, where do you see HRV playing in, in your future and the, the direction of your career coming out of school? Oh, that's a tricky question. So uh, I haven't really thought about that, but of course, you know, I've invested three years of my life, you know, researching about HRV. So I'm just I'm not gonna be, you know, leaving it anytime yeah. soon. So <laughs> Good. I am very much interested in looking at, you know, once, you know, 
with my PhD research, I've looked at you know the how combat injury affects HIV. I think it would be only uh, logical to see that you know how we could use HIV as an intervention now that we have seen the evidence. So I would be more interested in looking at uh, you know how we could use HIV biofeedback or, you know, resonance frequency, or, you know, all sorts of interventions, or, and also, you know, looking at HIV, like I said, like uh, HIV daily tracking or profiling and all sorts of things. So, yeah. Well, the, very cool. Uh, cause, uh, cause I was, I was hoping that would be your answer because coming out of just with this wealth of <laughs> knowledge and understanding, uh, so early in your career, uh, I, I was hoping you'd want to stick around and uh, keep teaching us uh, about this aspect. Because again, what, what you what the work that you're doing, I think is well. I know I, I think will be really incredibly fascinating. Not not just kind of the the ultra you know short term, which which was a new kind of idea for me. I mean, I could pretty much understand what it was, but. You know, just that little nugget was, you know, a huge thing that you are contributed to my understanding. And then obviously working with a population that we should all care about really, you know, yeah. powerfully um, and have been through trauma, you know, unpacking this uh, but the way you have is just uh, so important. So I, I'm glad you're you're deciding to uh, maybe continue to stick around uh, and teach us more and more as your career evolves. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you very much for your kind words, and that seems like a plan. And um, can I just take a quick moment and you know give a huge shout out to my supervisors? And of course, you know they they have been a huge part of this. Uh, please take all the time you would like to uh, give them credit, please. So, yeah, so you know, uh, Professor Christopher Booth and uh, Professor Ahmed Kadav and everybody at the dormitory because you know it's just not one person's job really with you know these many participants. Yeah. So I'd like to acknowledge everybody you know have played their part. You know, ranging from the admin to the data collection team and to the project board and everybody involved. So, yeah. Thanks very awesome. much to you, and thank you for your kind words and you know the appreciation of the work. Great. Well, I'm going to put a link in the show notes. People can find that as always at optimalhrb.com um, mm -hmm. with all the articles you have written on this. Because, like I said, your bio is incredible, and you're still in school. Like, like this is like so. I can't your CV coming out. Uh, you know, <laughs> incredibly impressive to any. Uh, future Thank employers you. that uh, you might <laughs> have. So, uh, but but I'm really excited and I am serious about uh, once you publish that uh, post-traumatic stress uh, article and you can talk about that research, I, I you may, you know, contact your friends and family and tell them there's another article they need to read. But <laughs> I want to be like in the top five people you contact <laughs> after publication because uh, I can't wait to see you have such a unique data set um that that I, I doubt you know not everybody has access to so i'm really excited to see uh what what comes out of that work that you do so uh let's just count this as the first uh hopefully several uh podcasts we do together because i can't wait to to explore that uh piece of your research with you sure i'd be happy, happy to share the link with you so Awesome. And I'll, I'll put your uh, university link in, in the show notes. Anything else? If somebody wants to get in touch with you or learn more about your work, uh, is that the best place for them to go yeah. or any other place that you might recommend? No, I think that would be the best place to go. Are you looking at the, the staff profile? Then? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that would be the place, yeah. Thank awesome. Well, I, I will put that link in the show notes. And my friend, I cannot wait to have you back on the show. <laughs> at a later date. So thank you so much. And just as somebody, again, who's worked with veterans more on the clinical yeah. side of things, uh, what you're doing, I, I've, I we have a lot of conversations with the military about how, how we get special forces to be more special with the heart rate variability and HRV bio feedback. Mm -hmm. so I, your work is so important. And like over here, we have the Veterans Administration and helping so many of our vets that have physical and mental health injuries uh, from experiencing war that, you know, this research uh, is just so powerful, um, already pouring it to a bunch of people that I know doing the work. So I appreciate you. I appreciate your focus on this. It's a huge gift uh, to anybody who cares about this population, which should be 
all of us. Yeah. So thank yeah. you so much for your work. Thank you very much. And it's been a pleasure to be here. And like I said, you know, I've been an avid listener and I've been following all your podcasts. So it's been a true pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And we'll see everybody thank next you. week. <laughs>